Got it. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday morning Life Life Bible study on Ezekiel. Uh, it's a great morning. I mean, have you guys noticed how uh, how much sun we've had lately? Yes, it's, it's an amazing thing. I feel like we've all picked up and moved to another state. Uh, <laughs> going to be warm today, but it's nice and cool in here, and uh, that is a blessing. We uh, gather here in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it would be good and appropriate to worship him this day. And so let me cue up our opening hymn. I still have it here. I'm not sure if you've uh, if you've sung this before. Um, I know there's a there's a version. This is uh, one of those hymns that you could sing in place of reciting the Apostles Creed. I don't know that this is a version we've sung, but uh, it's more extensive than the other one. So, being led by uh, a, a professional voice, uh, let's give it a shot, shall we? Oh, we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Stop it for one moment. I, I'm not sure I set this up right. Jill, can you hear it at home? Yeah, I didn't think so. Let's try this again. Sorry about that. They're showing up. It wasn't showing up before? No. No, it was black. We all believe in one true God. I heard some music. All right, we're going to try it again. Jill, can you hear it? Yep, we hear it and we see it. Very good. Here we go, everybody.
a new one. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful words. words. It's a beautiful tune, though. We're just it's yeah. kind of hard to sing the first time through. Well, something maybe we should practice. And it starts like another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, change uh, uh, yeah. We all believe in one true God. We wanted to start belting it, and then yeah. <laughs> yes, that's not it. <laughs> Let's continue on with our time in worship. Hopefully I didn't exit out too far out of everything. There, everybody still is. Okay. We continue on now with our time in worship, and uh, let me put on the screen our responsive read. It's responsive to read Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in all the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have established strength because of your foes. When I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. <laughs> You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field. The birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. I don't have it on here, but let's... Uh, Follow up for me. Glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Good job, everybody. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, how majestic is your name. How majestic and wondrous is the works that you do in my life and that you've done in each person here. Those that are gathered here in the fellowship hall, those that are Zooming from home, and those that might watch this later on, you know who all they are and you've planned for their presence. Lord, may your word bear upon their hearts and minds. You know better than anyone what they need to hear. May something from this Bible study lift them up, encourage them in their faith, and help them in their witness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, God, be with all of those amongst us who are mourning at this time including the families of Emily Burr and Nancy Miller. Grant them your hope and your strength through their faith in the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. be with our dear sister Bonnie. Grant her healing and comfort and also strength as she mourns the passing of Ken. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. dear Lord, be with our dear sister Faith. We're so thankful that she is here and that she is healing. We ask that you would continue that healing in her life. Grant her patience and strength as you work that out. Grant her complete restoration of sight. Lord, in your mercy. Your Lord, God. Lord God, we give thanks for all of the men here that are working outside for our yard crew. We give thanks that they have servant hearts that are they're exhibiting uh, love and care they have for this your house. Be a watch over them, be with them, and keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we give thanks for uh, Al's uh, son, Jason, um, who was hospitalized with blood clots. We're thankful, Lord, that they've been dissolved. And when it's time, when you know it's time, we ask that uh, he would be released from the hospital and be restored completely to health. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, be with me. During a very, very busy week, grant me guidance and strength. Lift me up, body, soul, and spirit. Help me to fulfill all of my vocations, both as pastor, as husband, as father and grandfather, and as neighbor and witness to you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we appeal to you on behalf of the leaders of our nation. Grant them wisdom. Grant them the ability to take care of this problem with the debt ceiling, with all the other problems that are going on in the world. Be with our president and his advisors. Grant him wise advice that comes from you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, be with Ron and Karen. We ask that you would uh, 
be with Karen during this doctor's appointment and that uh, it would serve to grant her wise and sage advice that will re the end result being that she will be restored completely to health. Be with Ron as he stands by her side. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with us now as we, uh, pretend, as we prepare to approach the study, Lord. Grant your Holy Spirit to speak into each one of our hearts and minds. Thank you, dear Jesus. And all God's people respond. Amen. Amen. Let's pray now the collect of the day. Almighty and everlasting God, you've given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity in the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O oh Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. You can see our worship this morning has a tinge to the uh, Trinity. And that's because uh, bonus question, what is this Sunday coming up? Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sundays. Oh, we go green. Uh, we're going to stay white, I believe. Yeah. It's supposed to be white. This green Sunday. happens. Yeah. For, the Sunday yeah. after Trinity, we go green. This, green. Right. We'll be green forever after that. Yeah, you're, you're going to be second green. Yeah. <laughs> our, um, our, uh, for whatever reason, um, the um, the pyramids that we have for Holy Trinity have a lot of green in them, and they really shouldn't. I think they're from Redeemer, but uh, I, we have two funerals coming up, which are white, so I think we may stay white. I don't know. Yeah, we'll be green for a long time. We'll be green for a long time. Anyhow, those are what we're talking about is liturgical colors. Being a liturgical church, our pyramids and my souls change to respect the color of the season. And all of those colors have uh, symbolic significance as far as what the season is about. Nice job with the red the other day with the children's message. Yeah. Very good. I think there's a lot of people in the congregation that needed that. Yeah, they don't yeah, necessarily yeah. know that. That's yeah. very true. Yeah. Red, yeah, red, the color of Pentecost. Anybody else know what we use red for? What other holidays? Reformation. Reformation. Um, Palm Sunday is kind of a red. It's not supposed to be the same color as Pentecost, but it's kind of an orangish red for whatever reason, Palm Sunday. And uh, when pastors are ordained and installed, we That's all right. wear it. Because the Holy Spirit comes down. Yeah. It's very good. Okay, we are on day number four in our Ezekiel Bible study. We might even get through day five today, we'll see. We haven't cracked open the book of Ezekiel yet, but I would hope that by our next gathering we will. This is so we continue our preparation. And so we talked about uh, beginning the um, political climate, what was going on in uh, the nation of Judah. And uh, in Jerusalem, when Ezekiel was prophesying over in exile, and then we talked about a couple of the offices that he fulfilled. Uh, we talked about the office of the priesthood because he was a priest that was never ordained. We talked about how he would look at holiness and those kind of priestly things, and also how he would feel because uh, because he saw things from a different light, a priestly kind of light. Um, and now we're going to look at the office of prophet because he is a prophet. And then if we get to day five, um, we'll look at symbolism because Ezekiel uses a lot of symbolism kind of along the same lines in Revelation, uh, how that is presented. With that in mind, we begin day four and let's start off by reading Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22. I'll put that on the screen for us. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, and your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up from them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. 
And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word of the Lord is not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if he does not come to pass or come true, if, if, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. What does Moses pro um, promise right off the bat? He's going to send a prophet to them. He's going to raise up a prophet from among them. Like who? Like him. So, and this is prophetic word. Yeah. And what's the near fulfillment of this? Who was the one like Moses that was raised up? Christ. No, that's that's like far. That's the far one. Oh. Joshua. Yeah. Oh. Joshua took over and led the people. He was the Lord's prophetic voice. He led them to conquer the land of Canaan. But you gave me the children's message answer. That's very true. Who is who is the complete fulfillment of this? Jesus. Jesus. He was not only the prophet like Moses. He fulfilled everything that Moses could not do. And like Moses, what was Moses? Moses was, uh, Aaron was a Levite. So Moses' brother was from what tribe? Levi. Levi. Tribe of Levi. So Moses was a prophet and a priest. How does that relate to who Jesus was, his offices? He wasn't a Levite, but he was a prophet, a priest, and a, a king. And a king. You could look at Moses as kind of being, having a political figure. He led the nation in a political sense. Christ more than fulfills that. He is king as well. So we can see how this relates to Jesus, can't we, prophet Lincoln? Why do the people want this? What uh, our question in Deuteronomy from uh, question 14, how did the people respond to the Lord's revelation of himself? Verses 16. They were kind of afraid that they were going to die. Big time. Horeb, that's another name for Sinai. Uh, as I understand it, Sinai is kind of the name of a mountain range. And Horeb might be more a specific mountain in that range. Um, kind of like the Black Hills. Or what's the Western ones? The Rockies. The Rocky Mountains. But in the Rocky Mountains, there are specific peaks. So Horeb, a specific mountain in the Sinai range. What mountain that was, we don't know. But if you find a guide to the Holy Land, they'll sure tell you. But I don't think that there's any certainty which mountain it was and why. This is kind of off the subject, but why would God not want us to identify what mountain it was that Moses received the Ten Commandments on? What would we do? Those we would venerate sacred places to go and to place rather than God. We would go there and we would bring our sick to be healed. And we would worship the place and not the Lord that appeared there. Do we have to go there to find the Lord? No. no. That's the other thing. As Jesus said to the woman in Samaria, time is coming and is now here when you will worship the Lord your God in spirit everywhere. So, Pastor, this is kind of like a thing in the Bible that sounds like it repeats itself over and over again. Children of Israel come to a location. And they say, who's going to lead us? What are we going to do? This is, this is the new place for us. We're, you know, and God steps in and provides. What about the Lord's appearance frightened them? They knew they'd die. They saw with Moses. He turned white. <clears throat> yeah, there was a white appearance of yeah. him. Um, so what we have here is we have God, the Lord, L-O-R-D, Yahweh, manifesting his real presence 
in a way that people can see and hear, right? right. They're not seeing all of his glory, are they? No. But they're seeing a cloaked representation of it. And in verse from verse 16, yeah. what exactly scares them in this cloaked representation? They're afraid that getting any more of the presence of God, they'll die. To the fire and uh, voice. Yeah, the voice. This the voice fire. scares the heck out of them. And this appearance of a great fire, an all-consuming <clears throat> fire. And we know from other sections in this uh, scripture back in Exodus that there was cloud and there was thunder, thunder and there was lightning. And what was all that communicating? I mean, was God's purpose just to scare the pants off of them and make them wet themselves? Why, why, why was he doing this? What did it communicate to them? That he was physically present in their midst. And who is it that's physically present? What are attributes you could say about the Lord from this? All powerful. Yeah. Mighty and powerful and, and scary. Um, and why would that, how could that be a comfort for this nation that's out in the midst of the wilderness, away from all trappings of safety? How would that be a comfort to them? Because if you put God on our side, who can be against us? If he, <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to mess with this guy if he's watching over us. Yet he's not a God that's angry with them. He has called them to be who? His children. His precious children. His nation. Chosen out of all the other nations in the world. So the God that loves us and has chosen us, he's all powerful. He's that, he's that bully that, well, not the bully, but he's the, he's the guardian that watches over us. And nobody's going to mess with us because of him. Yet because of his appearance, they didn't want to stand there and have to hear directly from him. And what does the Lord say about this? Is that wrong? What does he say about it in verse 17? They are right in what they have spoken. Yeah, you're right. You should ask for a mediator. You should. Because I've already provided it. And that mediator, mediator for them is Moses. Moses. Okay. But he's going to raise up another mediator to come. We know that's near Joshua. And there'll be others that come after him. Samuel would be one. But the end result is Jesus. He fulfills that mediator perfectly, doesn't he? How, did, how could he fulfill it in ways that Moses never could? Oh, Moses couldn't die for our sins. Right. Moses couldn't forgive our sins. He could be God's representative as you are. Yeah. But he could not say, I forgive you. Say, God forgives you. Right. In and immediate. Think about who Jesus is. Why does that enable him to be the perfect mediator? He's God. He's, He's God him. himself. God in human form. He's not in God's stead. He is God. Everything that Jesus hears, the Father hears and the Son hears. Everything that Jesus says. The Father says and the Son says, if Jesus forgives, the Father forgives and the Son forgives. If Jesus loves, finish it off for me, the Father loves and the Spirit loves with the same kind of love. So Jesus, who was willing to give his life on the cross out of love, that's the same kind of love that the Father has for you and the Spirit has for you. What a great mediator is that? That's Jesus being the perfect mediator as the word. The word made flesh. Other comments or questions on this avenue that we've trailed down? If you had to go before God, as he appeared on Mount Sinai, with thunder and lightning and fire, and a booming voice, would you want to do that? If you're like me, I mean, there was times when I saw God as the angry father. And I didn't want to go to him for my sins because I thought I'd get a whipping. But in Jesus, I see a whole different kind of God. I see a loving and forgiving God that calls me to come to him. And I can bear my soul to him and know that I am completely forgiven. It's good to have a mediator. Moses, going back to him, he was a good mediator because he was, well, what was he? He was a human being, right? 
he was not only a human being, but he was, how was he related to Israel? One of them. Was he a sinner like them? Yeah. So when he went before the Father, he did pass judgment on the people, but he also had to be somewhat in the boat because he had doubts, didn't he? He whined to God. What are you doing putting these people on me? If you think back to our uh, Old Testament lesson from uh, Pentecost Sunday, he was the reason why the Lord sent the 70, uh, gave the spirit to the 70 elders is Moses was whining about having to lead them. I don't want to pick on Moses too much. I've been whining too. But Moses wasn't perfect. And, and, and for that, he could be a good mediator for the people because he was in the boat with them. When you say mediator, I find that if you grew up in Flint or Detroit, you understand mediator a lot better than if you grew up in Nebraska or Iowa, <laughs> because we have a real view of the distance that can sometimes be between labor and management and how you really need someone to get these people together. So anyway, I was That's just thinking, when I was trying to work with kids and it was hard to, to, to talk about a mediator, but kids in Detroit, they know exactly people in Flint knew too. That's a great analogy. Exactly. Yep. Somebody to stand and, and bring, try to bring both sides together. And how do we always start out? Very far apart sometimes. Very far apart. Isn't that who we, is, who we are without Jesus Christ? We're about as far apart from God as you can get. That's a great analogy, Al. Thank you for that. Other comments or questions? Fourteen B. As a prophet, Ezekiel had to preach to an indifferent crowd in Babylon. What test did Moses entrust to God's people to decide whether the words of a prophet are the words of the Lord? If it comes to pass, he's good. If it doesn't, kill him. Yes. If a word does not come to pass or come true, that word is not a word that the Lord has spoken. And how should they regard him? Be afraid of verse him. 20, verse 22. <clears throat> Don't be afraid of him. Don't be afraid of anything he has to say. But the other thing was, you mentioned. Yeah, put him to death. Put him to death. That sounds pretty strict, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, why? Why would the Lord say that? So we do no more harm. It's, it's the law. It's the law, but what does it do for those people? It protects them, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Especially if that person rises to a, a position of prominence. And uh, especially if that person rises from within the midst. So you transfer that to this time now. Some of the most people that do the most damage in the church, where have they come from? Did they come from outside the church? No, come from within. Within the church. Claim to be a spokesman for God. And are not. Claim to heal with the power of God. <laughs> it's a sham. I hate to be the little guy trying to catch me when you shove me. <laughs> I, I've spoken to somebody, and I don't remember when or where, but they talked about knowing somebody that went to one of these <clears throat> revival guys, and I don't remember who it was, yeah. and said that uh, their relative was really sick, and told the interviewer that, the gatekeeper. They didn't get anywhere near the stage. Nowhere near the stage. Who was near the stage? The fake actors. Plants. Plants. <laughs> we still have those false prophets among us today? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, we do. I could go to my favorite whipping boy, but I'm not going to. <laughs> All you got to do is love. Jesus wants you to have a great life now. <laughs> What's that? Fancy cars. Yeah. yeah. Two of them, both of my, my favorite whipping boy and my favorite whipping girl all have uh, jets and fancy cars. All right. Uh, quick, 
What's that? Stop. <laughs> I said stop, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. You and me both. Um, Jeremiah, we're asked to turn to Jeremiah 31. A little bit later on in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. So Jeremiah was another prophet. Uh, you could call him one like Moses. He was the prophet that was working at the same time that Ezekiel was. Jeremiah was working still back in Jerusalem and in Judah, while Ezekiel was over in Babylon. Jeremiah witnessed the fall of Jerusalem, witnessed uh, uh, Babylon coming in and, and, and destroying the temple to the ground and marching everybody off. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those, those days, declare the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities, and I will remember their sin no more. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. What was the old covenant that he was talking about that he made with their fathers? That would be Israel when he took them out of Egypt. There was a covenant that he made with them at Sinai. Then there was a covenant that had to do with them uh, receiving the promised land. It's between the two of them that between God and man. You will be blessed if you worship me, but if you don't. There was a condition there, wasn't there? Was I will be your God, meaning I will supply everything you need, food and water, and I will give you the promised land, but you shall worship only me. Believe only in me, worship only me. That was a conditional covenant, right? And what does uh, what does Jeremiah say? What does the Lord say through Jeremiah about? how they did with that covenant. They broke it. They broke it. And here you have uh, this connection between idolatry and adultery. I was their husband. They were not faithful wives. They left me to worship other gods. Goes back to Flint and the union talk. What do you do after you arbitrate? You mediate. You come up with a contract. And that contract is binding. Yeah. By both sides. If one side breaks it. And because God's perfect and we're not, what's he doing? I'm going to make a new covenant with you guys. But, but even the old covenant, was it just one time and he was done with them? No. 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 He forgave them. Even though they broke it. Oh, and raised them up, broke it, and broke it. And, and even then, he gave them the sacrificial system because he knew that they wouldn't be faithful to all the commands so they could receive his mercy, grace, and forgiveness. All they had to do was do their part to bring the animals, to trust that those animals stood in their place and through them receive forgiveness, but they wouldn't even get on board with that. And not to knock them too bad, if we were back then, we probably wouldn't do that. So instead of that, what is, what is Jeremiah saying? What's God going to do? Make a new covenant. new covenant. And he describes it here, doesn't he? Look at what he says. Who's doing all the work in this new covenant? <laughs> I, will, the Lord. I, will, I will put my law in them. I, I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. No longer shall one teach his neighbor, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. For I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. I, 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 I. All blessings. So what kind of covenant is this? 
covenant of grace. God does it all. In the latter days, when were the latter days? Is that before Christ? Those coming days came with Christ. Remember, Jesus says, uh, he talked about a new covenant, New Testament, in my blood shed for you. Jesus is the author of this new covenant. Mm -hmm. Because of him, are our iniquities all forgiven? Yes. Because of him, is our sin no longer remembered? Yes. How about this, uh, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. How do you know the Lord? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit working through the word. He's called us by the gospel. So from the gift that Jesus gave on Pentecost and afterwards to each one of us, the gift of the Spirit, through him, this covenant comes to us. That's how we know the Lord. Before the Holy Spirit came, they had to read, they had to study, they had to understand, they had to have explained to them. I mean, we have that too, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them the way that we do. Who even if I'm not here preaching to you and you're not doing Bible study, can you read the word? Mm -hmm. Can the Holy Spirit speak to you? Mm -hmm. And then use the things that happen in your life to help draw you closer to him, to be life examples of what you learned in scripture. We know the Lord in a much deeper and better way than they ever could. Yeah, the, the sermon a while back. Uh, remember the This Little Gospel Light of Mine song? <laughs> yeah. What was the hope? Of, what? How are we different? We have that gospel in us. God yeah. gave it to us through our baptism. Yeah. We have that gospel. And you were saying like maybe that concept or that wasn't back in Jeremiah's time. No. no. These are the latter days and we know, we know the Lord differently through Jesus Christ. Just in Jesus himself, we know the Lord in a way that they never could, don't we? Because he is the word made flesh. Questions or comments on this so far? We're asked to read uh, Matthew 7. Matthew 7, I will start off reading verses 1 to 5. Uh, and the question before us as we read this is, how can someone beware of false prophets without judging whether their teaching aligns with God's word? So let's start with verses 1 through 5 of Matthew 7. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take a speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take a speck out of your brother's eye. So Jesus warns us, to judge not, that you be not be judged. And then along with what that means, he gives this parabolic example of the speck. So let's start with that. What is he talking about with the speck? What's the point of that little story there? How do you see speck in your brother's eye and ignore the log in your own? What does that mean? A lot oh. easier to see the fault of somebody else than to see that you might do the same thing or worse yep. yourself. And and that same fault, with what degree do you see it in other people that you don't see it in yourself? Oh, I see it big time. <laughs> <laughs> and if I even acknowledge that I have that fault at all, is it the same? The oh, no. You might do it a little bit, but nothing like they do. And if they mention it, oh. <laughs> 
So how do you take how do you take the log out of your own eye? What does Jesus mean there? Repent. Yep. Huh? Confess. Yeah. You're both right. Look carefully at yourself. Examine your own self. Confess any of those logs that particularly come to your mind. And then beyond that, confess that you have logs that you don't even realize or recognize that you are a, as we say in the confession, a poor miserable sinner. When you've gotten to that point, should you just ignore the speck in your brother's eye? Not necessarily. What, is, what does verse five say? First, take the log out of your own eye, and what then? And you will see clearly. Brothers. Yeah. It's not that we're not supposed to help our brother or sister in Christ, but first look to yourself and realize how you are. And how will that change your attitude to go and speak to your brother or sister? Compassion. Humility. Knocks you off your high horse. How about if it would be if, if you go to your brother after you've taken the log out of your own eye, it's kind of like standing in a mirror and you're really seeing yourself. You're, 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 yeah, I don't see Al. Al's the one that's got the spec, but I'm looking at him the same as if I've seen myself. Yeah. You see him to be a poor, miserable sinner just like I am. And he needs the grace and love of Jesus Christ just as much as I do. Otherwise, I rule over him, right? I'd say, Al, you know what? You just need to shape up, man. You are a disgusting piece of... That's me standing over him judging him, isn't it? Do I have any place really judging him? No. Who judges Al? And who judges me? God does. I think that's the reassurance, uh, reassurance of corporate confession in church, uh, where we do the silent confession, and then Tom and I stand next to each other, and we say to God as one, we are, and all of a sudden, I don't see a log in you, I don't see, you know, the speck in the log, because we're in the same boat. In the same boat. Lord, we all have logs, remove the log from mine, from Al's, from Tom's, from everybody. It's a great level. Yeah. We're all. We're all in the same family. Yeah, yeah. And, and every family <laughs> has its difficulties. And so I'm, I can't put myself above you, but I, I don't want you to be below me either. But when we're there, what do we have in common? We're poor, miserable. Very good. Verse two, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Are we judged? Who are we judged by? Mm -hmm. But mainly from God? Yeah. And how does God judge us? As forgiven people. And, but he <laughs> see, see, there is the ticket. When he looks at us, he doesn't see us. Yeah. He sees Jesus. Yeah. Yep. And so when we look at other people, how should we judge them? Forgiven by Jesus, just as he has forgiven me. As much as I want grace and mercy, because I know I'm a poor, miserable sinner, if my brother confesses that too, I want him to have that same grace and mercy. I want him to be judged by that same <laughs> grace and mercy that Jesus gives to me. We say it in the Lord's Prayer mm -hmm. about forgiving. Forgive others just as we have been forgiven. Yeah. But it's a hard, it, it, that's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do because you hurt me. Yep. And it's always there. Yeah. There's always that I forgive, but I can't forget. We can't, but the Lord does. Yeah. 
Right, that's why forgiveness is a, in a lot of cases, is a, is a process. It's a process of the Holy Spirit continuing to work in our hearts to get us to forget. We, and we claim that hurt, well, you hurt me, but who did that person really hurt? Not me. All sin is against who? God. Has God forgiven that hurt? Does God want them to carry that guilt? Does God forgive them if they don't ask for forgiveness? He forgave us. But when you don't ask for forgiveness, that gets to the point where you don't have faith and you are asking, you don't need a Savior. So without faith, are you forgiven? No. Faith is a conduit to receive everything that Christ has forgiven us. But he died on the cross before we even asked for forgiveness. Lack of faith means you throw all of your sins, you draw all of your sins back on yourself. All of the sins that Christ died for, you're owning all of them. You don't want him to take them. Give back to me. I don't need you to. Did I answer that question? We're pondering. <laughs> um, yeah. For giving us. Yeah. Um, there was something there. Obviously, the Lord doesn't want me to pursue it, though. Mm -hmm. Guilt, guilt and forgiveness. If God has forgiven them, do we have any right to hold anything against them? If God, if all sin is against God and He's forgiven, no. But that doesn't mean we have to allow Him to continue to abuse us. That's correct. Forgiveness is not the same as trust. Forgiveness is not the same as somebody being your bosom close buddy. You can forgive somebody yet keep them at an arm's length as far as a relationship goes, especially if there's been hurt. And then just keep your mouth shut about the hurt. Because yeah, the one they really hurt was God by hurting you. God will judge them. And when you think about the judgment that they'll receive without Christ, you really don't want that to happen. That judgment from God and eternal damnation will keep on going long after your anger is shriveled out. But that's an excellent point, Faith. If you don't allow them to continue to, if you can help it. But that's part of being a Christian. That's part of our cross. Because we don't get vindictiveness. We turn our hurts, concerns, cares, and concerns over to the Lord. Who knows us? I mean, does Jesus know how it feels to be hurt and abused and spoken against and wrongly accused? He certainly does. And instead of getting back at them, we forget. As difficult as that is. And that can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is a process. Anything else along this vein before we move on to the next section of Matthew 7? Read uh, verses 15 to 23. Uh, Matthew 7, 15 to 23. You were a false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from top thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. We'll stop there, I guess. So we're now talking about false prophets. We're supposed to be aware of them and recognize them, but doesn't that mean that we are judging them? Doesn't it? Playing the devil's advocate here, we're not supposed to judge, are we? I think there's good judgment. I think you can say, you know, it takes good judgment. And where does that good judgment come from? Does it come from up here? Yeah. 
we judge them according to God's word. And that's not just true of false prophets, but if I'm going to come up alongside somebody and say, hey, you know what, what you're doing doesn't please God, I'm telling them what God says, not what I say, right? But you have the Bible to back that up. Yes, so the judge, God's already judging them. I'm just communicating to them, not for the purpose of grinding them into the ground or making me feel better or pouring my anger out on them, as a way to, what's the end result of me pointing out anybody's sin? What do I want to happen in their life? That turnaround, that repentance. Confess and repent. Sometimes we miss that, don't we? Oh, yeah. Okay. I want to tell somebody what a bad symptom they are just because it makes me feel better, because they make me angrier. It makes me look better. But that's not the reason we should do it. People use that judge not lest you be judged. Well, how can you judge me? You're a sinner. Yeah, I am. But I'm not the one that's judging you. God is. And that's especially true of these contentious issues like homosexuality, transgenderism. Yeah. Yeah. Those are wrong, but not because Pastor Mark says they're wrong. Because God says they're wrong. I'd love to be able to say it's all okay, but it's not. And for me to do that is more of a hateful thing than anything else, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Lifestyle sins are hard. You come alongside somebody and help them work through them prayerfully, through law and gospel. Not just doing the Westboro Baptist thing, you know, all fags are going to hell. End of story. Bye-bye. Not that. No. Plus, in this day and age, if I find this church doesn't agree with that, I'll go shopping around. The church down the street's going to say, yeah, it's okay. Yep. But God's word doesn't change, does it? I, but what bothers me is people think that because you feel it's wrong that you hate those people. And that's not it at all. God never says to hate them because they live a different lifestyle. Truly. Doesn't even mean you can't be a friend of theirs and try to persuade them exactly. to be different by living a better lifestyle. A, a friend of them, yes, so you can witness to them, but not a friend that says, well, it's because to ignore their sin, is that really being a friend? Is that being loving at all? <clears throat> it's that the opposite, isn't it? It's a hard thing, though, and it's something that we can only really successfully do through the Holy Spirit's leading and guidance. Going back to this idea of, of, of false prophets, though. So upon what do we judge false prophets on? The word. The word. We, we heard that if what they say doesn't come true, we know they're false. But some of this future prophecy. So what's the other way that in verses 15 to 20 were given to judge people? And the fruits, and the fruits are what? Their action. The words, their words and their actions, exactly. Somebody claims to be a Christian, but is out there like the Westboro Baptist Church saying all fags need to die. That doesn't match up, does it? Mm -hmm. Was being a spokesman for Christ, Jesus wouldn't have said that. Let's read this next section, uh, verses 21 to 23. Okay. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everybody that calls himself a Christian going to be there on the last day with us? No. Is everybody that preaches like they're a Christian and says they're a spokesman for God going to be there? No. no. So my favorite whipping boy comes to mind. Joel, he preaches a good line, doesn't he? It's a popular message. So does Joyce. Yeah, I wish it were true. I wish that that's what God desired is all of us have success and happiness in this life. There was a TV show that I just watched 
and the fellow was in his car and he kept turning the radio dial and he kept listening to prophets, the religious guys on talk shows, on TV and on radio. And, and he was very upset because the ones he was listening to didn't tell him what he wanted to hear <laughs> until finally he got a channel and he said, oh, now I can do what I want to do because this guy says God said I can do it. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm getting too far adrift here, but no, sometimes that's right. we listen for the false prophet and we say, okay, someone from the church said it's okay. A true prophet of God is probably going to say something that does upset you because God's word, God's law upsets us and it should. What God commands in his law is the exact opposite of what my sinful heart wants to do every single stinking time. We want to make God our own sometimes. God in my own image, right? Yeah. Well, okay, this, this God agrees with me. But then we immediately say, oh, I agree with that. Did you know Scientology has their own um, channel on TV now? No, really? Mm -hmm. it, does on, it does on my TV. I have AT&T. So I'm like, are you kidding me? Well, and it's Scientology, and it's all different programs promoting their. They got a ton of money. They're tax exempt. <laughs> they shouldn't be, but they are. Yeah. No. So your favorite whipping boy? Does he skip parts of the Bible then in order to sure. pass his message along? Sure. You, you ever hear him? I, I don't watch him that much. I don't. I can't imagine. He ever preached about Paul's suffering and misery. And yet Paul being uh, uh, an obedient uh, servant of Christ, that doesn't match with his message. His message he has no theological life. training. His message is Jesus wants to have a good life now. Did Paul have a good life now? No. no. But who do we consider to be one of the most faithful apostles? Oh. That doesn't make sense with Joel's message, does it? Joyce is the same way. Who? Mayor. Meyer. Meyer. Joyce Meyer. Yeah. So, uh, Joel's, well, there's other things, but one of the greatest examples of Joel is this idea that God wants heaven on earth now for you. Joyce Meyer, um, she, one of the easy things about her is she proclaims that um, when Jesus descended into hell, according to the Apostles' Creed, he finished suffering for our sins in hell. She stands by that. Where'd she get that? Good question. Right in her head. Well, he went to hell. He must have been suffering. The problem is she uh, she <clears throat> ignores what Jesus says on the cross. His final words. Tom, what are they? It, it is. is Jesus didn't go to hell to finish suffering for us. He had to endure hell on the cross. He went. Therefore, he went to hell to proclaim his victory. Her words don't match what we know to be true in scripture. Therefore, should you listen to her? She has some good things to say. Like a lot of, um, pen, uh, not Pentecostal, but um, churches that are not Lutheran, Protestant churches. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of message on how to live your life as a faithful Christian. But as far as messages of grace and forgiveness, that is different. The other thing that comes to mind with her is uh, when asked about her, her husband has a ton of expensive cars, they have a jet and everything. They live an opulent lifestyle. And she's been asked about that. She says, well, I've been a faithful servant of God and I'm, I'm getting my just deserves now. He's rewarding me for my faithful service. <laughs> Well, uh, he's sure rewarded, rewarded, now. He's sure yeah, rewarded exactly. Paul, didn't he? <laughs> you know, and there's the point too, okay? She's receiving her reward. What did Jesus remember? What Jesus said about they've received their rewards now? Yep. So is there going to be any reward for her in eternal life? No. I'd rather have rewards for eternity than. A short period of time where I'm served. So, uh, go ahead, Tom. I want to just touch on Paul for a minute. We first hear about Paul before it was called Paul. 
standing there holding the cloaks of the people that are stoning Stephen, the first martyr of the church. And then all of a sudden he's on the road and the Lord come down to him in a thunderbolt. Probably scared the bejeebers out of him. His lifestyle, he understood completely what it was to give up everything. That's how I see it. I, you remember what Ananias said when he didn't want to go baptize Paul? He told the Lord, you know who this guy is? He was going town to town killing Christians. And one of the things the Lord says, I will show him how much he has to suffer for my identity. Yeah. Let's turn to uh, question uh, 16b on the back page of your study guide. Right? We've kind of answered this, but how may the Christian properly judge without frivol frivolously condemning someone who needs to repent? What's the proper way to judge somebody? Word. According to the word, so we're judging according to God's judgments, not our own. And the best way to do that, keeping in mind that they have a log, we have a log. I think one of you already said this is when you want to go talk to somebody about being a sinner, climb in the boat with them. It's not you're a sinner. We, we are sinners. And I struggle with things too. I'm no better than you. In fact, I'm no better than the people out there in the world. The only difference is I know what makes me perfect, and that's Jesus. That's the difference. And I want you to have that same faith, that same forgiveness that I have. We don't raise ourselves up by smashing them down. We come down to the boat with them. Do the work of the Holy Spirit, raise them up to Christ. Do the gospel. Questions, comments? Just in case you think you don't have a right to judge, you do. But judge by getting in the boat. Judge them as the Lord judges you with grace, mercy, and forgiveness. The other thing to keep in mind as we preach the law is many people we encountered might already be afflicted by the law, if not the law preached, the law not preached. So we keep that in mind. We don't need to be Baptist ministers and preach hellfire to everybody before we preach the gospel. And that's a hard thing to judge. And that's once again where the Holy Spirit comes in as we go and talk to people and minister to them, ask the Spirit to guide us. Okay. Let's see if we can move on to uh, day five. And we've got some uh, Zechariah 3, which we need to read 3 6 to 4 14. And uh, we can at least get started on that. I don't know how far we'll get. Um, Zechariah was a prophet uh, after the Israel, after uh, the Jews had returned from exile. And they're working on trying to rebuild the temple and uh, in Jerusalem. And they're struggling. And uh, Zechariah was one of the prophets that was speaking to them at that time. And they didn't always want to hear what he had to say either. So Zechariah. So Zechariah Malachi, it's the second to last book of the Old Testament, and we want to read in uh, chapter 3, starting with verse 6. Well, let's read Zechariah 3, 6 to 10. The angel of the Lord gave his charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house. And have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among those among these standing here. Uh, verse 10. Verse 10. Okay. 
listen, go hide this Joshua in, in your associate seat before you, for a man, some bodies of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua? There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave a inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. So here we have somebody who's speaking prophetically, using a lot of symbolism. Mm -hmm. Kind of hard to understand. Because he's speaking of spiritual things that are not easily understood. First of all, you should know Joshua is not Joshua who succeeded Moses. Joshua is a high priest who returned from exile in Jerusalem. He's functioning as a high priest and will also encounter this dude named Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel was somebody that was in the line of David from the tribe of Judah. And he was the governor of that time. So Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest. We have kind of, not king, but kind of a, uh, um, a secular, or the, that side, a governmental leader, and somebody uh, working for the Lord being in charge of religion. Those are the two guys that uh, are going to be dealt with here. How does it say, how does uh, Zechariah say Joshua the high priest? How should he live? What is to he be an example of? What does it mean to walk in the Lord's ways? To lead a sinless life. Of course, you can't lead a sinless life, but as closely as possible. Follow his commandments. Mm -hmm. And part of his commandments are when we sin, at that time, what should they have done when they sin? Ask for forgiveness. And Through the sacrificial it. system. Okay. Regularly offer up sacrifices because <laughs> regularly they sin. So not claiming to be perfect, realizing you're not perfect, but making use of the grace and mercy the Lord sends through the sacrificial system. And as a priest, would it be important for him to demonstrate that for the people? Yes. Probably more so. How does that match somebody like myself, pastors, today? How am I supposed to live? The same way. Not claiming to be perfect. A private confession, an absolution. Joining you in corporate confession, an absolution. Reading and studying God's word and asking forgiveness. And when I mess up with you, what should I do? Ask forgiveness. Ask you, be honest about it. And as I try to do when I preach to you, I climb in the boat. It's not you are sinners, we, I, and you. I try to be in the boat with you. What does he say in verse 8? about Joshua and his friends. What are they supposed to be? A sign. A sign. A sign of things to come. To point forward to a sign which is usually something greater that is to come. Looking forward prophetically. And, he, and along with that, uh, the Lord promises he will bring my servant, the Ranch. Who might that be? Jesus. Give me the children's message answer. Jesus. Jesus. But that's something we, we don't think, I don't think about that much. We, you mentioned the sacrificial system. And I just don't think about that. But but again, you're talking about they did, man, just think. I, I did it again. I did that sin again. I, I've got to make another sacrifice. i got to make another sacrifice. Now, in those days, people are saying, well, I'm getting tired of this. That's sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. They were wasting a lot of food in their head. But now, as pastor said, but they're moving ahead now from the greatest sacrifice, which is to come, yeah. to take the place all that. It, it was a reminder that the animals were not sufficient. 
I forget was, they kept doing those sacrifices. It was, it was a reminder that they were they continued to sin and they continued to need a sacrifice. Animals were not good enough, but there was always held out the promise to the sacrificial system of this perfect sacrifice to come. And John takes it, John the Baptist, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the final sacrifice. After him, no more sacrifices are needed. All of the sacrifices pointed to him. Tom, you got something on your heart there. Oh, it's, and I, and I heard that. I agree with you 100%, Al. That's why we come to confession. We don't have the sacrifice, in, but we have the confession of my church on Sunday. And we can do that with that our, our own personal confession. God, I'm in stuff. We don't have to run to the altar anymore. But it isn't any different. I think that they understood that they messed up. So what they do, they went of a pigeon or whatever it was. So what Pastor's saying though, that this, like you said, this prophet's like toward the last of the books of the old testament. And this guy is saying, right now, sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. But then you moved us to, wait a minute, he says, there's a time that's coming. Right. So he's getting, making that transition here at the Old Testament. Is that, that's what you're telling us, if I'm listening right? This is all pointing, yep, some of it is for now, but something is all pointing forward. And that's especially where the branch comes in. So we said the branch is Jesus. Do you remember what Isaiah said about a shoot from a stump? Jesse stump from Jesse. The branch, yep, from the stump of Jesse. So, and that Jesse, of course, that points back to David and the messianic promise given to David that one of his descendants would be the one. So that's part of what's under this branch. But there's more. What is a branch always connected to? A tree. A tree. And a root. And who is the tree that Jesus is connected to? God. And that means in all Jesus did, what was he doing? The will and the work of the Father. Right? Yeah. A branch connected to the tree. It doesn't just take a nourishment on its own. It works for the good of the whole entire tree. Where does the branch receive its strength and its ability to put forth leaves? On the root. From the tree. Yeah. From Jesus received his ability to do what he did because he was uniquely connected to the Father by the Holy Spirit. And that goes along with another thing. The purpose of the branch is to carry out the will of the root, the will of the tree, the will of the Father. And everything Jesus did carried out the will of God, wasn't it? And I think you guys kind of alluded to this, but finally, the branch and even the trunk you see. But is that all there is to the tree? <clears throat> Compare the roots to what you see. There were no roots, and there would be no tree. Aren't the roots normally greater, spread out in the ground to anchor that tree? Yeah. You just can't see them. You can see Jesus. What about God? Far more to God than what we could ever understand or fathom. Just like you can't see the root system under the ground, but you can see the tree. And if the tree's big and huge, you know that's got to have a pretty substantial root system to support it. Mm -hmm. Jesus, we can see. And through him, we know all that we need to know about the Father. But we know that there's far more about God than we could ever understand. Luther called it the invisible. Invisible God. Don't try to peer behind the curtain of what's not been revealed. Trust in what has been revealed, and that's Jesus Christ.
So here we have the symbolism of the branch. And how were Joshua and his uh, friends going to be symbolism or pointing to the branch? Joshua was a high priest. How does that point to Jesus, the branch? This priestly. Yeah, through his priestly functions. Jesus will fulfill those functions in a way that's greater than Joshua ever could. Joshua was charged with encouraging people to continue building the temple. And some of those people, when they got back, they were, we want to build their house. Let's get our house built and then we'll do the temple. No. Build God's house first. And he'll take care of you building your house. Focusing people back on God when they wanted to focus on themselves. Is that a job Jesus did? Then we have in verse 9, the stone that I've set before Joshua with seven eyes. How does a stone prophetically relate to Jesus? Yeah, very good. Uh, keep your finger here and turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and we want to read verses 15 to 18. And he said to them, Of who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We talked about the word Peter and rock being related in Greek. Uh, Peter is pebble. And rock is a huge boulder. And so what he will build a church on is not the pebble, not Peter. But what is the rock? His faith. Yeah. yeah. Specifically what he confessed Jesus to be, right? Yep. The Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, but not just a man, the son of the living God. That's how Jesus is the rock. And then you can go on to say, remember uh, Jesus being the cornerstone yep. on which the church is built. And what is that cornerstone? It's this confession that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And we're built off that because that's our confession, isn't it? He is our Lord and Savior. And we are built off that. I often wonder how many people realize when they start singing Rock of Ages. Is that a that song that's sung, you know, even in, in secular, you know, in the secular thing? Uh -huh. People sing that. So that, what are, what do all, what do people think that that means? Well, I never know. I can never answer that. Yeah. Probably don't get it all the way, do they? No. Let's uh, turn back to Zechariah chapter 3. So we've got this rock, this stone set before Joshua, and it has seven eyes. Those of you that are part of the Revelation Bible study, what does the number seven mean? Complete. Complete. And what is the function of eyes? See. All seeing. All seeing. So this rock and seven is also associated uh, with the spirit. The seven soul spirit in Revelation, which is the Holy Spirit, who is everywhere in the world and sees all. So this rock has the spirit, knows all, and sees all. Is that a way to point to Christ? Yeah. And connected with that stone, I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. Now, what is that prophetic of? 
if the stone is Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, how was the iniquity of that land removed in a single day? The cross. At the cross, when Jesus died. And he said at the end, it is finished. <laughs> Joshua, get that temple built. Continue with the sacrifices. Keep them pointing forward to this final sacrifice because what's going to happen when it comes in a single day, all of the iniquity, all of the sins that the people are offering sacrifices for will be taken care of forever. One of the purposes of looking at Zechariah, and, and if you've been in the Revelation study, you're aware of this, but a lot of prophetic things were very symbolic, but so it could speak to things that were happening at that time, but also point forward to a greater fulfillment to come. So we can see now this is encouragement once again for uh, Joshua to keep the temple, build the temple, keep the people faithful, reinstitute the sacrificial system, but not just to do that, just to be busy with, because they need to remain in faith and pointing forward to something greater to come and that greater thing is Christ. Questions, comments? So when we get into Ezekiel, we're going to see a lot of prophetic things that are highly symbolic. Um, we'll figure them out. And one of the greatest ways is when you're reading these things is always to keep in mind, how does this point to Jesus? How does this point to the need for Christ or for the way he fulfills what we need? Because as Lutherans, we confess that the, whole, the Old Testament is all about Jesus just as much as the New Testament is, right? Our need for him, what he has come to do. So we'll stop there. And when we gather again next week, we'll dig back into Zachariah and walk our way through that. Any final questions or comments or anything you didn't have time to mention before? You're all pondering. Did I leave you behind in the dust somewhere? <laughs> no, good stuff. Okay. There's a lot to be thought about. A lot to ponder. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good. I'm still here, but I'm you know, trying ponder. to figure it out. Ponder away, and uh, may the Holy Spirit help you with that. And if there's any way I can help be more clear or explain things better, let me know. Questions. Questions are always good, and there's no stupid questions. Just one, and I was going to ask this the other day, and I didn't. What is the meaning of theologian? Um, it doesn't. Theo is about God. Right. So it would be the study of who theology. God is through the scriptures. Study of God's word. Yeah, especially taking that word and applying it to our lives. I would say doctrine, too, because... Uh, the Bible is not set up where we have one chapter is all about sin, and this chapter is all about faith, and this chapter is all about uh, justification. And, you know, it's it's the doctrines that we hold fast to are spread throughout the Bible. So a theologian, and this is also the, the great work of the uh, confessions, is it takes all these different doctrines from all over the Bible and puts them into one understandable place. So in the confessions, when it talks about justification, how Jesus justified us in front of God, made us right, it cites all different sources, Old and New Testament, so we can understand that. So are we theologians? Yeah, you're studying God's word. But there, there is a connotation that they're kind of professional, maybe. I don't want to say that they're, they've are they done a lot more stuff. I would never well, consider those, myself a theologian who devote their life to the study yeah, of the scriptures. Right. But but in a it's sense, a we are all those. But I'm not as, I'm not in a place to speak as authoritatively as others are, like seminary professors. Right. Yeah. But you are a theologian. Because I study God's word. Yes. And so are you. Good question. So it's, it's, it's 
I think the mindset of most people is, is that it's the people that have, they're in depth. Yeah. Oh, well, theologians that kind of puts us on the outskirts and not in the middle. But, yeah. Theo is God. That's a, from the that's, Greek word for God, God. Right. Theo. Good. Anything else? Good. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this study doesn't leave you in the weeds quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> So far, it's been a little bit different than our study of David, but uh, I hope you're all still on board with it. And I, I, I hope it bears fruit in your heart and your life. Well, you got good students. So. You do. You guys are awesome students. Let's close with prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the, uh, for the contributions that each and every person makes in our study this day. They bring forth great points and, and they're pondering things and they also make me ponder things as well. May your Holy Spirit walk with each of us as we leave here this day. Spirit, speak into our hearts for these ponderings. Point us to your scriptures and help us to understand some of these deep things. But bottom line is, Lord, we're not going to understand everything. All we need to do is trust that Jesus Christ has completed all of the work that needed to be done for our salvation. And your, he sent your spirit who holds us fast, fast in faith now into life everlasting. May that be our thing of trust going forward. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. We'll gather together again uh, this evening for a revelation. Those of you that won't be here, we'll see you on Sunday. Oh, by the way, we have a baptism on Sunday. Oh, it's not just Holy Trinity. In fact, we have uh, two baptisms father and son that's great take care y'all okay y'all god's blessing you y'all